And we are live. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Today, we are going to be talking about two movies that star the late, great George Segal, who just recently passed away. We're going to get our movie and film scorecards up to talk about Born to Win, which is my film choice from 1971, and the movie choice from Steve, the movie guy. Fun fun with Dick and Jane. Perfect. All right. And so the film scorecard is my film scorecard, complexity, emotional, strong acting, ambiguous and universal life. Sorry, not life. Universal questions and or answers. And the uh, movie scorecard is coolness, feel, clear story, entertaining and wow factor. Perfect. And in order for, we're going to start with fun with Dick and Jane, in order Mm -hmm. for this to be considered both a movie and a film, it has to get an overall score of at least an 8 out of 10. If not, it is a pure movie. Okay, so over to you, Steve. What's the plot here for our audience who may not have seen this? Why, thank you, Robert. I will give you a brief uh, plot as per IMDb. They always have the most excellent plot descriptions. Uh, Fun with Dick and Jane. When an upwardly mobile couple finds themselves unemployed and in debt, they turn to armed robbery in desperation. Yep, that's correct. So, okay. So number one, coolness. My coolness point what i'm talking about here is it's overall cohesion did it look good sound good main thing was i checked my watch was i bored okay uh i'm gonna give it a half a point it's sort of a yes and no because it did move well for the most part good songs uh you know it was fun and colorful and the performances were good but it also felt a little clunky here and there and there's some stuff tied up with the plot that i'll get into when i touch on my clear story category um yeah so overall like it it feels like it was meant to move cool it was meant to not be an art house you know film it was meant to look like a movie even though and we can touch on this later i think filmmakers intent can dictate a film or a movie sometimes. And funnily enough, I mean, I've always said this, what a movie's about is not necessarily what its plot is, right? Like you can have a movie that's about a a priest's struggle, you know, with his own faith. And you can have Winter Light by Bergman. And what you're seeing is the about. It's It's that. But you can take that same about and then put it in The Exorcist. And then you got, like a movie and with fun and fun with Dick and Jane, funnily enough, I think there is something the director's trying to say, the filmmaker about, you know, uh, a comment on commercialism on, on capitalism in the U S or the Western world. I think there is more of an about than is usual with a movie, which is fine. I just don't think for a movie, it wasn't preachy at all. It was, it felt kind of superficial, which is not a bad thing, but it just, mm, it, it, it had moments where I was looking at my watch, like, I get it, let, let's go. But it was fine. So overall, it gets a half point for coolness. Um, yeah. I, I'm just curious, when you say clunky, is it just that if you felt that certain things didn't match the tone or... I'm just a little curious what you know. The by tone clicking. was consistent. It was pretty flippant, which is fine. Um, no, that was fine. It's something that, well, I'll, I'll address it now. It's more about the plot and I'll touch on it again later. It's, we take a long time building up to the, well, what, what the description's about, them committing armed robbery. It really takes a long time. I'm not complaining about that. In fact, that buildup, just watching them behave as a couple while their house is, you repossessed and he tries to get on unemployment insurance and that's fun. That's great. Right. But then we jump in to the armed robbery and they're so cool with it and fine with it. 
And that's where I felt like, oh, our message is like the people cheering them on when they robbed the telephone company. And I'm like, yeah, I get it. They're badasses. But I didn't buy that these they were too comfortable. And then, mm-hmm. but that's okay. But that's okay. Yeah. My real problem was a plot thing, um, which I'll, I'll wait. I'll touch on that. Um, okay. But yeah. Tonally, no. I think it had a very nice, colorful, you know, comfortable uh late 70s you know it was funky whatever uh, yeah so it's not terrible it just it meh, it didn't quite make it so yeah half point uh, okay four. very cool so coolness gets a half point uh mm-hmm. for complex for complexity i'm gonna also give it a half point i actually saw this film not that long ago i would say last year of course i heard mm-hmm. about it for years and I thought it was okay. I just, I, I was actually a little disappointed. I thought, I thought I'd like it Same. more. I watched Same. it again mm. the other night expecting to have the same reaction. And I mm. had a completely different one. And I thought mm. either I went, stuff went over my head or I wasn't in the right mood, or maybe I got caught up in the gags and the, the lightheartedness of it. Not lighthearted, but that it's light. But I forget. It I, is. I, I think I missed that it's actually really a satire. Sure. Uh, oh. And yeah. And everything that and and you know you don't necessarily like them, but it's funny. Right. At the, and it's <laughs> at the same time. But I think it really says a lot about like what you were saying, Steve, uh, about consumerism and mm. capitalism, and you know, r- refusing to give up what you have uh, yeah. because of the fact that you lost your job, you know, because here we have a guy who lost his job and he's his wife's going over their finances and he spends way too much money and he refuses to compromise what he spends. So what does he do? He goes on EI and then he gets kicked off of it by breaking yeah. the rules, you know, and then he's... Um, he, uh, uh, they go on food stamps and I like the guy who, who uh, approves the app. Well, he doesn't mm. approve it. He gives the information that they were approved. And he's like, well, you know what? This is a shame because this is for people who really need it. And you can just sell your house. You yeah, know, you, you got your own, uh, Jane Fonda is more, um, sensible, even though oh, she's yeah. uh, like, she's also nutty like him and an egomaniac, but She's not as bad. She's a little more like, well, hang on. Why don't we just sell the house? And he's like, no, no, I refuse. No, I refuse. He, this he's, is- <laughs> he's the one with the, it's the pride, right? Exactly. She, she's a little more willing to, well, we don't need yeah. the chandeliers and things, you know? Yeah. The swimming pool and all this stuff. Um, mm. And he, it's, but it's really uh, essentially that, um, you know, that greed and, you know, doing whatever you need to do, even to commit crimes in order to keep your status, in order to keep your money, in order to keep uh, y- what you have. And he gets offered a job early on and he's like, yep. mm, I think I can do better. Meanwhile, they're taking everything out of his house. And he's just he's a, he's again, it's pride. He's an egomaniac. He's a pig headed uh, but it, it works so much as in a satirical way to make fun of them and to say, this is America, or, you know, especially, uh, and that is, uh, will always be relevant. And I've seen people do that just, you know, well, why don't you cut some corners and uh, uh, no, we can't, you know, and it's not that I know people necessarily rob banks or <laughs> rob liquor stores. Uh, but I thought it really had a lot to say. And even those scenes where they get a dose of what reality, like he's hanging out with those Latino guys in the bar. And because he says, por favor, as the officers come in, they arrest him because he didn't have his uh, citizenship or ID on him. Right. So he right. gets a taste of uh, what it's like to perhaps uh, be poor, uh, in the, especially when they go to get a bank loan. Oh, it's going to be 18 percent interest rate. You know, so all these things are infuriating but funny at the same time. So for me, it it really is gets a it is it does explore that complexity in a very direct way. Uh, so for me, it's it's a half point. Over to you. Uh, feel did it emotionally grab me? Yeah, I mean, you know, you get it. It's it's yeah. not yeah. Whether you're looking at that layer of uh, it's it's uh, sat it's satire. It's commenting on um american uh middle class or whatever 
it, it, it doesn't matter if you just watch it for the images like a baby looking at a mobile above their crib it works and it doesn't it isn't a, a thoughtful film as you watch it it's funny it's quick it's quippy it's cute um yeah it's quirky you 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 kind of you root for them even though they're um yeah you do the bonnie and clyde of the upper middle class you know <laughs> um but anyway yeah i yeah it, it appeals to you emotionally so yes it gets my feel uh point yeah i agree in a way you you do root for them which is odd because you don't necessarily like them but because they're so ridiculous and they're like it's funny like when people do stuff that is so stupid in order to keep their lot in life to just you know like you can't help but sometimes to laugh and i think that's where the gags played really well like like i said he's getting a job offer while they're taking stuff out of his house and he's still saying no and <laughs> so in terms of emotional yeah i gotta say it hit the humor uh, the ridiculousness of it all, of looking at how ridiculous people can be in these situations. Uh, and even in terms of, you, I, I also found myself getting mad a lot. I mean, in the end, uh, you know, where, well, I, I won't do my usual spoiler alerts where I give everything away, but I was very angry at the end. But I also laughed because I just thought, wow, this is actually shit that ne doesn't necessarily happen in this way. But happens, you know, when you're 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 sometimes the greed, unfortunately, wins out and the corruption wins out. Um, and it's man, it's balls to the walls. It reminds me of like later we saw Wolf of Wall Street. Uh, I think that was sort of similar. And like, look, how I don't think that worked as well as this. In my opinion, I think this the point came across so much more because of how ridiculous it is. And I think the audience got that much more. So in terms of emotion, yeah, definitely. Um, next, clear story. Uh, this is, yes, but yes, everything's clear. Everything's clear. Everything's answered, 100%. So technically, I should give it full marks, but I'm not going to. Because while it's clear, I'm going to also grade the story, its structure for a movie. Mm. My main problem is like, again, I'll excuse this long setup to get to like the sort of arc, right? Like it takes forever, but it's not boring to watch. So it's okay. Um, but like, if the movie's about, you know, whatever these, these two turning to crime, that takes a while. Right. Um, okay. But once they turn to crime, even though that's the synopsis of the film, that's very short lived in the film. Like that, that it's all sort of like a, a like a rocky training montage. It all sort of <laughs> goes quick. They're too comfortable. They're too. There's no repercussions. It's so airy fairy. It's too easy, and I get lost in that. And even though it's a movie, there's still rules to making a good movie. And yeah. here it was even too superficial. But the main thing was this sort of this crux, this sort of this main thing, the, the, the ending. And so quasi spoiler alert for a film made 45 years ago, but uh, is when they yeah, go and rob Seagal, exactly. They rob George Seagal's old dick, his old boss, Ed McMahon. Yeah, there's no I don't care. Like they introduced that idea of robbing him. And then wrap it up all within the same sort of, uh, if this were a play, all in the third act. And so right. what I'm saying is for that to work, you had to introduce the idea of stealing from him at the beginning. You had to introduce at least that he's got a safe. You have to introduce that this guy does shady things. All this guy does, Ed McMahon, is fire Seagal to get things moving. Then we really hear nothing. Of, that's it. And yeah. then right at the end, he comes back and, oh, P.S., he's shady. He deserves to be stolen from. He's right. crooked. And then they do it. And then they have a little, they try to make it like a big plan with the cops and we're going to spin it around on right. you and right. kiss my ass. That was all done so conveniently. It sucked. And that hurt the movie so much to me, which is unfortunate because it, it was fun. That sucked. And that Ed McMahon's character, 
he totally could have had them arrested. That's bullshit. Bullshit that he's like, oh, yeah, you, you got me over the barrel. No, they don't. That was ridiculous. And it felt like such lazy tacked on. We're going to rob from like their comment on society. We'll rob from the big guys because they're trying to screw you anyway. Like, OK, you rebel hippies in your giant house. That was bullshit. And it <laughs> undermined so much of the movie for me that it negated the shit I did like. Not to say yeah. I hated it. I didn't. I totally didn't. But that hurt the story because that is the story. But, but it is all clear. So I'm going to give it a half, even though I want to give it nothing. No, I'm going to give it a half. It gets a half. I'm done. Wasn't, um, but if, if Ed McMahon had had them arrested, what wouldn't he have then? Because that money that he had was stolen, right? So I guess he could have had them arrested, but then I guess he would have got in trouble later once that money... I don't know if he would have. Like, that's so convenient that they can prove it's stolen. It's his money in his safe. Well, that's, I don't, yeah. I don't know that the I don't know that anyone would investigate what money was stolen. You know what I mean? Like, if your house was robbed yeah, and they yeah, took your yeah. DVDs, right, are right. they going to ask, well, where did you get these DVDs? <laughs> Who cares? They're yeah, mine. yeah. It is a so, little, that's true. I didn't think of that. That yeah, it is a that little a, too and, and, and uh, fast. It was cool, like the idea, but it just, it was so like, it felt like someone came on in the 11th hour and went, you know what? We'll just write this and, and, and it's, it will flip it. See what happens. Yeah. And I'm like, nah, I don't think so, guys. So, nah. I, I wonder, I wonder if in terms of their comfort with the robbing, because at first they are uncomfortable with it. I know very quickly they do. A like little, you see, a little. like he gets the gun caught in his pants and the guy thinks. Yeah, but then he that has a gun. Pharmacy. They yeah. don't show that he's scared of it or anything. Like he yeah. confidently just, I'm, I'm taking my gun out with me tonight, huh? <laughs> and then the comedy is that it falls down his pants. Not that he doesn't know how to use it. Not that he's considering maybe murdering. So like, and I'm not saying this from a 2021 <gasps> guns. Yeah. No, even in the 70s when everyone had a gun. It well, maybe that's it though. Everyone and had a gun. And now as well. <laughs> but, and now as well. <laughs> yeah. I, I thought it was even in the States, anyways. considering it was still like that kind of like a, a hippie movie with Jane Fonda. I, I'm surprised the gun. Okay, I'm not saying address it like it's oh like crazy. Right, right, right. But right. He just, it was so glossed over that this nerd in right. this rich neighborhood <laughs> owns and is fine yeah. with using a gun. Like, fine yeah. with it. Like, yeah. like, again, I call bullshit on that, man. It was I, funny. I, yeah, I, I wonder if it was, uh, I, I agree with you. Uh, I wonder in part if it was, if you're not necessarily supposed to believe that, but all, but just perhaps get caught up in the satirical well, and a, absurd nature of it. But that's that's uh, a the reach. Fe the that's a feeling reach. of it. Yeah, I suppose so. I yeah. agree because I some movies that. that know how to do that, like take your Ferris Bueller's a day off, day off. Right, right, it, right. You know, you you get who gives a shit, right? Or Star yeah. Wars, they're in space. Like I don't give a shit. It works. It just works. Here, for whatever reason. If it's glaringly obvious, it didn't work. Right. Right. Like I it's not like I went into this wanting it to fail. This was my pick. So, you know, so, I know, I was gonna say. <laughs> so, you know what I mean? Like if you go and yeah. watching something like, oh, this is gonna be terrible or whatever, if you're looking for I wasn't looking for problems. So right. that I found them is different than when I'm looking for them. I, see I was just mean. looking to yeah. be entertained, and it still yeah. didn't. I'm not saying it didn't entertain me, but it didn't take me, uh, like you say, it didn't wash over me to the point that I excuse this. Right, right. You, no, you that's know. a good point. I, 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 uh, I agree. I think uh, mm. I don't. You know, I think it happens so fast that you well, know, we say that it, with a, a lot of movies. Sometimes, even with Hitchcock, right? Like we mm. had discussed. Like I'm like, well, how did this happen? And because they move so quickly, which is more of a movie thing, you forget about the logic. Uh, so perhaps, and I think for uh, many people, I think even Ebert uh, said similar things, like just some things didn't work. It was just obviously standing out as uh, mm. not being uh, justified. Whereas perhaps when Ferris Bueller does things that are obviously would never come true, but you, 
it, it's true for him because he's 18, you know, yeah. and like that he would it, think that would work. <laughs> it's just, I think it comes down to the script and the director, you know, and, and uh, if it's well written and well handled, then it works. Yeah. And so something just wasn't clicking in right. that regard. There's a lot that works for it, but anyway. Yeah. No, I, I, I think that's a good point. And um, it's interesting that, that it's interesting that me, the film guy, <laughs> that that wouldn't have popped out to me. But for, for you, it was like, what the, and for me, who always looks for, for the, the justification of things, I was like, nah, it's all good. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead and rob those liquor stores. And um, I, I think I just got caught up in the feelings of it and the, the both the, the absurdity and the, the anger of, of, you know, like, what, how can they be getting away with this? Uh, which again leads me to the performances. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think you know Jane Fonda and George Segal. I think they're perfect for this because the director is definitely there's commentary in what he's saying here. Uh, obviously, it is serious, but they're doing it as a comedy. They're doing it in a satirical way, and I think you need actors uh, who can have that comedic timing, but also uh, bring uh, an emotional depth to it. And Segal and F Fonda, who both did, you know, balls to the wall comedies and then did, you know, really uh, heavy dramas uh, were perfect for this. So I thought the timing between them was great. I thought the rapport was great. Um, and I thought, you know, originally I read that they apparently offered this to Faye Dunaway first. And I don't think that would have worked because she's a good actor, but I've never seen her funny. I don't, I don't know how good she'd be in comedy. Uh, Jane Fonda, I thought, was just perfect. And then you had uh, supporting roles, Ed McMahon. Uh, and I forget the guy. He was in a lot of gangster movies. He was the guy taking the trees out of their house. Uh, he was in Midnight Run and a lot of like gangster comedic, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, with yeah, the I mustache. I know. Yeah, I with the films. Him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I but I, I, I thought it was well casted. And you know, again, George Segal uh, captured the arrogance. The you know, this guy's homophobic. He says even racist things. He's, he's, he's pig headed. He's, he's got a huge ego. He's angry. Uh, and he's uh, eventually corrupted, you know, and he's, he's your typical, uh, macho, um, you know, toxic kind of guy, but yet he's fuck, he's funny. And like, I think that's why you root for him because if he, if the actor's not funny, you're going to be like, these people are despicable. Uh, so I think without these two, you better have gotten someone who can match what I just, just what I just described. Mm -hmm. So acting. Yeah. hundred mm -hmm. percent. Yeah, no, I agree with that. Um, okay. Entertaining or captivating. I'm going to give I'm it starting a half. To think, I'm going to start to think this is my pick. <laughs> I'm going to get, I'm going to give it a half. Uh, <laughs> because ironically, you've heard me say this about three times already that the setup goes on for so long when the whole kind of premise is about this couple turning to robbery, but it takes so long for them to get to that. But the irony is that journey of them getting there was more entertaining than when they get into the robbery. When yeah, they that's get true. into yeah. the robbery, yeah. I don't give a shit. There's no heart in that. It doesn't appeal to me because it's just a vignette. It's, it's, it's supposed to be funny. Like he goes to the record store and he's so calm and like, yeah. kiss my ass. Like I, I get that you're, I, whatever I, I, it bugged me. So the, it will, it was entertaining up to there. Uh, and then after that, it was still captivating to a degree. And what I finally settled on is I find the movie and there's nothing wrong with this at all. Like it's a comfortable movie to watch. It's very safe, comfortable, good for when we watched it, which was like, you know, a Sunday late afternoon with dinner. Like it's that. And there's nothing wrong with that. But that to me doesn't make it captivating or entertaining. But on the other hand, it wasn't not those things. Like it wasn't like a, oh God, or huh, what do they mean? Like, it wasn't that either. So right. it was simple, but kind of ham-fisted. So I'm going to give it a half, another half. Yeah, fair, fair enough. I, I, I find I, I don't, I didn't, I think I did the first time more. I was sort of, you eventually lose interest. Yes, um, yes, yes. And I, I agree that the, robbery uh at that point yeah it is less entertaining and less interesting than the build-up uh to that 
uh, because yeah, like you said, they're very comfortable and it's very quick and they, you know, get away with everything. Uh, but at the same time, um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, for whatever reason, the second time, uh, because I got pulled in more to where it was going and the feelings behind it, uh, I, I really enjoyed it, which brings me to ambiguity. Uh, no, I don't think anything is left open for the audience to interpret. I don't think anything is vague in terms of a motivation, uh, what's behind a motivation. I think it's clear. I think the obstacles are clear. I think the goals are clear. The uh, actors are articulate in what they're going to do. No, you're at no point confused uh, or ha left pondering. I think you're definitely left pondering about the intent. Uh, and definitely has a lot to say, but it's pretty direct. So I'm going to say no for ambiguity. Um, yeah. And finally, my the wow factor, like, wow. So what I'm trying to say here is it doesn't necessarily need to be wow. And there are great movies that I can do that. Uh, but even if I'm at the very least like, yeah, all right, I'd recommend this. I'd watch it again. That's wow factor. So here I'm going to give it a half uh, because I would watch it again. I would. I'm not dying to. I probably wouldn't go out of my way to watch it again, but if it's on or if someone wants to watch it, like, yeah, all right, put it on. Uh, I also wouldn't recommend it. I wouldn't not recommend, like I wouldn't not, whatever. I wouldn't right. say don't watch it, right. but, but not at all. But I'm also not going to tell anyone you got to see this. I'll say, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So it gets a half. That's yeah, all right. So okay. So, so my final so, score yeah, is three out of five, three out of five, three out of five. Okay. Which leads me to my last point, uh, universal questions or, or uh, message. And for me, uh, I would say, yeah, I would say I definitely ask the questions about why the hell uh, we, we need so much in life uh, and we will suffer <laughs> in order to keep it or get it in this case mm. rob for it uh mm. why and i think another thing and uh perhaps it doesn't perfectly work in this film but mm. unfortunately greed does win out corruption mm. sometimes i'm not saying always uh but these things do win and it's infuriating and ridiculous and funny in a way at least in terms of the way it's being depicted here um and i think it's saying a lot about uh, about all those things. So, yeah, I mean, you know, why can't we just uh, roll with the punches when things happen? Why can't you downgrade? Why can't you? I know it's not easy to sell one's house or maybe go into an apartment and that clause at our insecurity and our lack of loving ourselves and individuality. I think this these people are not individuals. I think they're totally about status. And I think this says a lot about America then, now, post-World War II, and for God knows how many more years. Um, so for me, it is a three and a half out of five. Yeah, uh, more than and, me. Which is, <laughs> which is funny because it's the movie uh, pick, or Steve is a three. So this is, a, this is something that hasn't happened before. No, so now we have a, It's not that good. Yeah. <laughs> it's a six and a half out of ten. Uh, so I think it's fair to say that it doesn't totally work as a film and it doesn't totally work That's as a right. movie. No. <laughs> um, so therefore, I don't know what it is. It's a, it's a it's, movie. It's a film. bit of both and it's neither. Yeah. See right. it if you want. I don't care. <laughs> I, I, I think, you know, for me, I would have said that on my first viewing. Uh, I, I actually think, I, I, I understand what you're saying about what doesn't work. I think if you, if one can just perhaps excuse that and just for me it, it it just captured such a feeling uh of their behavior and of their refusal to give up what they have and what they're saying that these are things i think about a lot and i i think for that it is it is definitely uh worth it because i think it really puts the mirror up i know it doesn't totally work on an on as a narrative uh, and it could have been better. I think uh, I never saw the remake with Jim Carrey. I don't know what that's like, uh, but uh, I think it holds a mirror up, and it was and it's universal in that sense of now, then, uh, and twenty years before then, thirty years before then. Uh, so I definitely recommend it. I think it's a, a really, I think it's really, really, really good. And you know, nineteen seventy-seven, 
late seventies film. I don't know who the the director of this did First Blood. He I did believe. First Blood. Now yeah. that's a good movie. Yeah, that's really good. That's um, really really yeah, good. Yeah, Ted Kocha for something. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we move on to the film pick, which is chosen by me. This is Born to Win from 1971, which stars, of course, George Segal, Karen Black of a small part from uh, Robert De Niro, uh, also Hector Al Alizondo, who's in many, many films, James Bert Fletcher. Young. Burt Young has a cameo in this. It was directed by Ivan Passer. If anyone hasn't seen it, the plot, according to IMDb, is a smart mouth junkie and loser known as JJ, spends his days looking for just one more fix. So whether or not it is complex, yeah. I mean, in terms of, here we have a guy who, it's very unique, and I haven't seen too many portraits of addicts on screen depicted this way, because in order to steal, he uses his charm and his humor, and at the same time, he lies to himself. I think that the irony of the born to win is perfect, because he calls himself a winner. He's got a tattoo, and I'm born to win, yet everything he's doing in life as a result, unfortunately, of his addiction is bringing him further and further into self-destruction and further and further into his addiction. Uh, so it, and it, you see how he's uh, hassled by the police. He's used, we saw that in Panic in Needle Park, he is used to get bigger drug addicts. Uh, and he also says that, you know, if it wasn't for the fact that he was in New York and it's the, oh, it's where I live, and I'm being tempted all over the place. I gotta get out of town. When he gets out of town, what does he wanna do? He wants to go back. Uh, for money. And Karen Black says, what do you have to prove? And that's when he, of course, you see, he uh, he begins to, um, uh, what's the term for when you need drugs? And withdraw. withdraw. He begins to 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 withdraw. Uh, also, Karen Black, you, 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 you know, here's a woman who, who, who sees him when he's, when she's, when he's robbing her. And like, she likes, like, she gets caught up in it. And then you think, well, why would you like someone? who's robbing you and is an addict and is troubled and in trouble. Um, and I think it's sort of, uh, you know, in, I think she gets off on danger clearly. So they're both the addicts in that sense. She's obviously addicted to that way of living. I don't like when you, when, when you read reviews about this, they say she's free spirited. And I think it's deeper uh, than simply being free. People can be free spirited, but not necessarily pick up someone who's in a car, uh, robbing their car and, and doing drugs and potentially getting her into trouble. So it's definitely a, a complex look at uh, a self-destructed uh, person who lies to himself, who says he's all about peace and love while he's putting a gun to someone's head. You know, he's got a wife who now is a hooker. She's also an addict and she's working for the drug dealers. He's got two kids. He doesn't see, uh, he's destroying himself and he goes further and further and lying to himself more and more. Uh, so for me, complex, absolutely. Uh, okay, for me, coolness, it's interesting listening to you. I started picturing the movie again and I'm going to change, I think my score. Uh, I was going to give it a half, but I'm going to give it a, a full coolness. Like it. Oh, good. Cause the only hang up I had, I'm like, well, in retrospect, I don't remember it that way. So if it didn't stand out that way, like if I'm thinking, I only saw it a couple of days, like three, four days ago. Was this so, your first viewing? Yeah. And okay. so like looking back, I'm like, well, the things I wrote in my notes here, I'm like, they don't know. I'm not remembering it. So I'm not going to begrudgingly stick to what I wrote. I'm like, no, I don't, I don't recall that. Uh, and I'll tell you what it is now. So I'm going to, yeah, uh, like immediately, you know, it moves real well. It's got a great score that suits it. And by great score, it doesn't mean it's by known rock and roll. No, it's like source, you know. Oh, I rock, love the score. And roll. Yeah, it's, so it, it works. Yeah. It's like the shit you hear like, the studio trying to be hip and like weirdo rock and roll jazz. It doesn't matter. It works and it's really good. It, does, yeah. it looks really cool. It's definitely your gritty, grainy panic yeah. in needle park new york city um but a lot more fun than that um and and as you say i do agree it's such a unique take without turning it into slapstick no but but like why do i have to like it 
it got me to thinking the other night about this movie, and I don't know what I think about this movie, called Last Days by Gus Van Sant. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's sort of about Kurt Cobain. And that's a miserable portrait of a man in trouble. And right. this one was a great, and that's usually what we get. The, exactly. You know, and exactly. so to see, you know, this is probably, I've met some of these guys and they are like George Seagal. Yes. And yes. Uh, they are way more three-dimensional than the Cobain characterization. Mm. And they're more like, like George Seagal is a fully fleshed human being in this. Yeah. And he was, yeah. he was great. Um, everyone was. And, and like with your Karen Black comment, yeah, if you look deeper, she might have an addiction to danger. I do chalk it up to, and, and opposed to Fun and Dick and Jane, I think I was, maybe it's a better script, better director, whatever. It just worked better for me in the way it moved, never checked my watch. And so I do excuse some things like, I don't know, excuse. Like, it just, I, I didn't feel a need to kind of analyze the Karen Black character. I just bought, like, you see characters like her in movies from the late 60s and early 70s that are, you can call them free spirit, whatever they are. I never questioned right. their getting together. Uh, it worked. And, and yes, we can sit here and I can write it. Well, it shouldn't have worked. I don't know. For me, it did. For me. Yeah. Um, and so the like complaints I was going to write down. I, I actually think my complaints uh, uh, helped it because I, I my thing was well what if it come you know, the pacing it goes fast and it slows down that goes fast I'm like you know it does it well though like it knows when to pull back it does, and when yeah. to throttle yeah. and when to, it's like it feels like driving on a highway and sometimes yeah. you can you full speed ahead and then up some traffic but you get through it and full speed ahead. and so it worked and as you said the supporting cast also Paul Apprentice um uh was in it and uh yeah man and i love hector elizondo i'm a fan of his oh he's really good i, I just yeah. think he's really cool yeah and he, he's usually in richard gear movies but uh this one is not a richard <laughs> gear movie and no he is it's like a deal they had made yeah. when they were unknowns or something right. and uh like i'll help you and you help me but uh blah 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 yes it gets it totally gets the cool mark back to you yeah, I, I mean, for me, there there were a few things that I, I felt some of the humor didn't quite work. Like when he goes into the 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 man the the uh, men's clothing store and just like I love that. Them, like, <laughs> I mean, it's funny. I just thought, how would the guy not have noticed that he? I, I agree, <laughs> but I was willing to let it go. It, it didn't yeah. matter. And yeah. him walking down the street, he gets the coat on, but he's barefoot. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, yeah. I've seen this right here. You know, well, that's a good point. Yeah, that you know what? That's a good point because you do see some weird shit like that, and <laughs> you're like, Trump, "Why Trump, are you yeah. dressed like?" Because of that. Because probably yeah. something like that. Something happens. like that. So, which yeah, you I don't, never think I agree. of. Yeah. No. 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 Exactly. Yeah. Because, and and I think that's what's so unique about this is that it, it like yeah, you said, it's, it's usually man. it's usually like the last days, right? Where it's like dark, and and it is dark and depressing. But, you know, it's they're not all, always necessarily like zombies walking around. Exactly. And, no, uh, I know. You know that they're not. And, yeah. You, you know, and I and I've talked to addicts. I'm sure you've talked to addicts. And no, yeah. uh, they can be uh, having fun and, and doing crazy shit. And we, uh, I'm not saying that's a good thing, but uh -huh. I think this film really shows uh, really shows this really, yes, man. Um, really, really well. I which agree. brings me to uh, emotional. Yeah. I mean, I think the first half. Uh, is much lighter. It is funnier. Um, and the second half, I think it's once you start to see him withdraw uh, mm. with Karen Black, that's when it starts to get mm. darker, you know, he, and then he starts to go down a, a, a further and further down the rabbit hole in order to mm. get drugs. Um, mm. You know, like people are after him and he still goes back to New York. He's still and you're like, what are you doing? Uh, and I think those scenes with Karen Black are, and I think another reason why it may work with Karen Black, you know, you think, well, why is she with this guy? But uh, whether or not she's addicted to danger, when when he starts to withdraw, uh, you see she cares for him. She wants to help him. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, you know, there's love there. Why she loves it doesn't, you can't explain why anyone loves anyone, right? Exactly. So uh, you just accept it. Uh, and I think you really feel, um, both perhaps the uh, joys of this guy's life, 
uh, the ups and the deep, deep, deep downs. And I think, like you said, it's a fully flushed out portrait of a, 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 a junkie. So yeah, emotional for sure. And speaking of which, my next category feel, yep. Um, yeah, uh, it's not a think piece. It's not something, it's not just that, that doesn't say it's stupid or superficial. It's just not the kind of movie that, um, it gives you answers as it goes along in a good way. That doesn't make it stupid. It doesn't make it obvious. It doesn't make it superficial. It's just, it, 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 and it's not to say it doesn't ask questions. It just like frame by frame or scene by scene, what you're watching, you understand. And not only that, we'll touch on that in my next category, but it is, it, it didn't um, necessarily grab me by the mind. It grabbed me by the belly. And I like that. Yes. And, and, yeah, it does. And, yeah. And so, yeah, uh, that's all I can say about that. It gets the feel mark for me. Yeah, I agree. Which leads me to performances. Yeah. I mean, again, we're dedicating this talk to George Segal. And I think, you, like with Fun with Dick and Jane, you need an actor who can both be dramatic and funny. You yeah. know, I think if you had cast a very dramatic actor in this, the humor and the, some of the joys this guy has and the timing with him and Karen Black wouldn't have worked. Well, you need someone who understands the tragedy and humor of life. Uh, nothing's just funny. Nothing's just dramatic. Everything is, there's a, a um, you know, a, a blender of feelings to, to everything. Uh, so yeah, I, I love, you know, it's funny because I went to, I saw, I've seen this so many times. I saw it in 2003 when I was 16, of course, as a big De Niro fan, consuming everything with De Niro. De Niro has a small part in this uh, to say, oh, I got to see this because De Niro's in it. I went in to watch De Niro and you leave thinking about George Segal, you know, like oh, what yeah. a fan. And every time I go back to it, I go back to it for the story and for for him. Uh, and yeah, you know, De Niro's uh, good in it. He has a small part as uh, a corrupt uh, police officer, very young. I think he was like 27, 28 in this film. It's unfortunate that, uh, you know, I've seen this DVD everywhere around Toronto, I'm sure. And it's always like they put De Niro on the cover, right? And it, I, as a way to sell it. And uh, it's a shame because I think it's, it's, it's all, this is a really about JJ, who George Segal plays. Uh, Karen Black again I you know perfect casting like you need someone who's crazy and like <laughs> whether she's addicted to danger or free spirited Karen Black plays those kind of parts whether it's Easy Rider or even uh, the House of a Thousand Corpses and and uh, uh, Five Easy Pieces she's in so many films of the 70s she plays both the sweet and the crazy so so well uh, she's just such a great actor uh, so yeah, definitely for the acting. Uh, and I also really like the guy who plays uh, uh, Billy, uh, one of the uh, addicts. Uh, what's it, Jay Fletcher, I think. Yeah, Jay Fletcher, another character who shows both the highs and the lows. Um, mm -hmm. He says, oh man, I like our life. He gives us a purpose every day to go out and get our drugs. And this is great. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. like, okay, interesting perspective. But I'm sure that, you know, they. I'm sure that addicts have that perspective uh, at times. So Yes, acting Hector Elizondo as well. So yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, all well said. Uh, clear story. Yep. Uh, you know what's cool about this to me was you know I went into this because it was your pick, thinking it was supposed to be a film, and this is what I said earlier with in regards to the other movie we were talking about that I think sometimes the filmmaker's intent, regardless of its subject matter, but the style in which they're going to make this film um, can kind of dictate if this is going to be more of a movie or not, at least for my eyes. And what I mean is like, you give me the pitch to this or I read about it or like, Oh, it's a film for sure. But the style, the tone, the way this, you know, this director decided to move forward with this thing for my money, he did it like a movie and yeah. it moves. And the kind of, yeah. this will relate to my clear story. I mean, everything you've already said, yeah, the clear story, it's not, it is incident driven. Yeah, it's about a junkie, but it's not about yeah. in a an lot obvious happened. way. A lot exactly. Yeah. Like it's not last days where I'm sitting, you know, watching a guy sit around, fuck, yeah. whatever. No, this guy. I'm sure there you could argue, well, this film's really about this guy's internal struggle. Whatever. The second I hear internal struggle, I can't watch an internal struggle. So what they do here is they they load it with incidents and little like vignettes. And so it's constantly moving. Uh 
or maybe not constantly, but when it slows down, as I said earlier, it's, it's a good time to slow down and reflect and uh, whatever. And then we get moving again. And uh, it, 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 what's really cool to me here is, you know, whether it's, it's a uh, Superman or a junkie, if there are clear characters, clear motivations, you set up a clear conflict and then a clear adventure or story. And that's all here. Right. So just because, I guess all that to say, just because it's about, you know, a uh, junkie and whatever. E me, I'm guilty. I thought like, okay, what's this going to be? But little did I know. Yeah, but we're, we're treating it like a movie, people. At least to my eyes. And um, so that, to my point, makes the story very clear it's a very clear story and you know it's it's everything you've said you've also got the introduction and it's and it worked because it's set up in a series of like misadventures kind of like fun with dick and jane where if they took that ed robbing ed mcmahon and wrapping it up premise if it was in a type of film like this that is incident driven that's okay because you're giving yeah. me a mini you know, three act story each time an adventure happens with uh, fun with Dick and Jane, you're, you're giving me one overall premise, which is mm. fine, but then it's trickier to introduce big elements later. Uh, you got to start to plant the seeds early on. So here you don't need to worry about that because it's all little adventures and there's an overall arc. Think of it like a, a really good series, like Sopranos, like, each episode has its own yeah. so arc, but there's an overall season, right? you know, and here, if you look at born to win, like an overall season, and there is one kind of through line with a bunch of little episodes. And, and one of those episodes I thought was really interesting is getting him De Niro and uh, the other cop, getting him to narc on Hector Elizondo. Right. And, and uh, who, yeah, I, I, this is where I give things away. I don't want to. I really, really don't. Because this movie is very interesting in, in where it ends. It ends in a sort of cliffhanger. Yeah. And uh, I think it's really unique and well done. So anyway, yes, clear story. I could go on about it. It was really cool. But yes, it is clear. Yeah. No, you nailed it there. It's uh, while being truthful, it also has a very conventional structure uh in terms of you know introducing of your characters and a, a number of incidents and those incidents all make sense and they all are justified because of who he is and what he does i mean it starts with him robbing a safe right so <laughs> you know and he does it in his charming humorous way uh so yeah which leads me and you're right it has the cliffhanger which leads me to ambiguous uh i, I would say half i would say yes at the end where does he go uh you know, he gets that, he gets those drugs and, you know, he's sitting, well, I mean, I don't want to spoil it. <laughs> Since you said you do want to spoil it, I should also not spoil it. But I, I'll, I'll phrase it in a way where I'm not giving it away in terms of um, w once he's sinking, sinking and sinking, sinking, what's next? Is it death or is it to get better? He's got things in his life that he has, th he's got children, right? He has things, he has things that he could, he has purpose. Uh, so it's kind of up to the audience, right? In terms of, uh, you know, it's also called Born to Win. He's got that tattoo. Maybe eventually he'll see the light. I don't know. It's really up to you. Uh, and again, it's it's Karen Black, I think. Uh, but for me, I, I've seen this, this. This was the first time I really questioned why she was doing what she was doing. I took it as she must just be addicted to danger. Uh, perhaps people would think she's just free spirited or they will just accept it as you know, because just take it for what it is and what she's doing and she takes to it because that's who she is for whatever reason. Uh, I, I, that is definitely open. It's not spelled out. You don't know, a, you know much less about her than you do with uh, George Seagal. Um, so for me, yes, it's definitely a half. It's mostly clear. Um, so back to you. Uh, entertaining or captivating? Yep. Uh, and you know, it would be easy to say, well, it was captivated. No, it was actually entertaining. All I need to do is, is think about him in that pink robe getting thrown into kind of kidnapped 
and then trying oh to get a neighbor God, yeah. across the way to call the police on him. Yeah. And it's ludicrous and fun and it shouldn't be because it's about a heroin addict, but whatever, I guess they have senses of humor too. And they're people too. And, right. uh, <laughs> anyway, yeah, no, I it's true. <laughs> I, I, I don't know what else to say. It's adventurous and quirky. So yes, it's entertaining. Okay. Very cool. Uh, which leads me to my last point, uh, universal, uh, questions and or answers. Uh, this is a tough one because I think it's a very accurate, uh, portrayal of an addict. You know, they actually literally interviewed uh, drug addicts. They did a deep dive into that world. I think some of the actors in it actually are drug addicts that they literally use for some of the smaller roles. So I don't know if necessarily it's universal to say that all this, you know, junkies will always be around and it will always be like this. Uh, I don't know. I think it's very much of it's the 70s saying this is what it is. It is bringing you into that world. I'm being very truthful about it. I don't think there's necessarily a commentary or a questions uh, being thrown out there. Uh, so I'm going to stick with with a no. Uh, I'm open to changing that. But for now, since we're here filming, I'm going to say no. <laughs> so all in all, it's a three and a half out of five for me as a film. Well, and Back to you. this, what a turn of events today. Uh, wow factor. Yep. Uh, I'd watch it again. I'd yeah. recommend it. I I really enjoyed the sort of flavor it left in my mouth. I when I I I tell you like when I look back on it, I'm like, oh, that was that. What a I really felt like I was there. I feel like I'm not remembering a movie, but I'm remembering a memory. Yeah. Um. It yeah. really put me in that weird world, and because the quality of it's shitty, the quality I saw on uh, Hoopla, and it's on YouTube too. I think. Yeah. Yeah. But but it, it works. The shitty quality works. And I, I don't want to see a cleaned up version of it. And uh, um, yeah, what else can I say? So it gets a five out of five for me. Funnily enough. Okay. Three so out of five for the other thing. Five out of five for this. So it's an eight and a half out of ten, which means that is, is a movie and a film. And I think that's accurate for just to sum up. I mean, like everything you were saying in terms of having its three act structure, it's driven by incidents and obstacles, uh, introduces characters, which are clear uh, for the audience to understand, uh, but which is a very movie traditional narrative, um, but then has those elements of ambiguity of not cl cleaning things up, particularly uh, uh, towards the end. Uh, of having things that are just not necessarily spelled out. Um, but, and again, like I said, it just, it brings you into that world. So yeah, I mean, I think that's a, a pretty good uh, score to give this. And, I, and like I said, I've seen this so many times and every time I, I see it, mm -hmm. I, I see something, I see something else. I, I never saw really how much he lied to himself until the last viewing. I was like, wow, this guy lies to himself a lot. Uh, which is, which again is something you see more in life than you do perhaps in, in cinema or in movies. Um, and it's a shame because like you said, uh, I don't think this has been remastered. I think a lot of those prints we see are old prints that were the, uh, the film is obviously decaying. I don't think the film foundation or anyone has remastered it. Uh, you know, they slapped it on a DVD. I've seen this for five ninety nine, and I don't know how many Walmart shelves, which is a shame because uh, well, I shouldn't say it's a shame because it's there, you know, so for people to see it. But, um, you know, it's uh, I'm surprised it is not something that is championed more. It's definitely one of those hidden gems from the 70s that people forgot about. Uh, apparently, there is a print at uh, a museum in New York uh, where because apparently what we're seeing is slightly edited. Apparently, it, it was yeah. um, a little four more. Minutes. Yeah, four minutes were cut. So there, I, I don't know if that print was is remastered. Apparently, there's a 35 millimeter print. Uh, so God, that would be cool to see. Uh, I would love to see that. But I hope this film uh, gets its day uh, at some point because I think it's. Uh, I don't know anyone who knows it. I've never even, you know, talked to it about it with anyone other than right now with you. <laughs> so, had you heard about it before? Uh, before? No, not until you mentioned no. it. Yeah, no. yeah, it's uh, uh, a phenomenal I, yeah, film. Yeah, I liked it. That's cool. Yeah. No, I'm glad you liked yeah. it. Uh, so yeah, there we go. Really those cool. are our, those are our two uh, George Seagal films. Uh, just a brilliant actor. 
And we also uh, composed a, a list of films of his just briefly that we love and ones that we want to see. So wh- which ones of his do you really like, Steve? That I haven't seen a lot, like, because you know, he's one of those guys that you know, wasn't a movie star. He technically was a movie star, but uh, yeah. he, 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 yeah, whatever. He didn't, I, I didn't register him the way I did Paul Newman or Steve McQueen or something. Um, but I'd always seen him. And right. uh, I never really focused. I never went out to go find, oh, you know, we should watch a George Seagal movie. Like, I just, uh, I don't think that way. And um, with him, not because he's not good. It just, it just didn't work that way. And right. so the ones I've seen, um, I don't think he's a star in any of them. Um, I remember seeing, I don't even remember him in this, but Lost Command. Uh, it's a oh, yeah. war movie with, I think it's Alain Delon. Uh, and I do remember him in it because he's a movie star. He's just that kind of guy. Uh, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, of course, which is probably the first time I, no, the first time I ever noticed Seagal but I didn't notice I noticed him because I was a kid was look who's talking, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, which, yeah, yeah. which is right. fantastic. And yeah. I saw it again, not long ago. I love I, that. I movie. really love it. It's love still it. watch it. If you watch it, it's really good. And yeah, anyway, is, is. He, he's in that. And so I knew him, but it, later uh, I went to see um, who's afraid of Virginia Woolf. And, and I was like, Oh my fuck. Is that the guy, the old man from uh, mm. look who's talking? And uh, and it was, and he's great in that. And I just saw that not long ago. Um, and then you know, it's all like I I know him more from when he's an older guy uh, with supporting parts in movies like The Cable Guy or Flirting with Disaster, right? Um, you know, and TV, right? Like he, he, we all know him, or we I know him from uh, a sitcom called Just Shoot Me, and yeah. and then he was doing I think the Goldbergs, um, yeah. at the time. Uh, of his death so uh th- th- those are the only ones I, I i can think of that i've seen not many and then now he, these two you know i remember also growing up uh yeah i mean he was the guy i had the same experience the guy from just shoot me and then when i started to really get into film this was one i was like george Segal, the guy in all those the old guy in all those comedies and uh i i this was a, something i really loved uh, another film I saw early on, like you had mentioned, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? Uh, he plays a supporting part in that, which uh, he's also great. And I believe that's his only uh, Oscar nomination, uh, which is a shame. But he's it's a, a great performance. Another film of his, another director who's very underrated uh, filmmaker, in my opinion, Paul Mazursky, made a film called Bloom in Love from 1973, which is also with Chris Christopherson. Uh, and I forget the woman's name. She was in five easy pieces. Uh, God, I can't remember. She only pa- she passed away uh, not too long ago. Uh, but again, it's a little like uh, he plays. He's he's. If you look at his the stuff he did in the seventies and the sixties, he plays guys who are fair, full of flaws, unlikable. Yet you end up liking them because he has this everyman quality and he has this humor and dramatic flair. That to me is unforgettable. Like I have always really, really loved him. And I think with uh, happens to a lot of actors, they get older, they start to do more TV. They're not getting the leading parts anymore. And they start to do television and, and supporting roles and, and comedies, uh, which he did. It's kind of similar to Elliot Gould. If you look at his career, mm-hmm. also a guy in the seventies and sixties, who was like a major uh, player uh, and was sought out and, um, you know, as they got older, they did a lot more, uh, like I said, television and films. But I've, I've always really, really liked him. Uh, another one, this is a TV version of Death of a Salesman where he plays Biff, uh, 1966, with him mm-hmm. and um, uh, Lee J. Cobb. And it's really good. I got it for, I don't know if, how easy it is to get. When, when um, Queen Video is still around, Steve, they had it on DVD. And I remember renting it. Queen mm-hmm. Video, for anyone in Toronto, I'm sure you know, was a video store that just recently closed down a couple yeah. of years ago, like like every video store in the world. Um, and I saw it, and it's he's really, really good at it. Another, I think this was his big sort of break was King Rat, which is a war film. Yeah, that um, I do. That's on my list of things I want to see. My uncle loved that and told me to see. Really it, good. And I, I never saw that. Yeah, really good. Uh, that was something that they played on Saturday night at the movies. Of course, we're fortunate to talk to Tom Ernst, 
who was the last host of that show uh, mm. this Thursday that I saw. A lot of his stuff I found on TVO, Saturday Night at the Movies. California Split was another mm. one I saw, uh, Saturday Night at the Movies. Him, and that is Elliot Gold, where they play gambling addicts, which they just put on the Criterion channel, which yep. I love. Uh, yes, Look Who's Talking, definitely. Uh, Flirting with Disaster is another uh, film. David O. Russell, Ben Stiller, that is is excellent. Like, he could just lend himself to so many things. Um, is there any other ones that popped out that you hadn't seen that you want to see? Yes, 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 yes. So King Rat was, like, on, I won't call it a list. It wasn't on my list. I don't have a list. But, but when I was looking at George Seagal, and that came up and I was like, oh, yeah, my uncle always wanted me to see that. So that is now something I will look out for. But also, uh, I want to see The Owl and the Pussycat with him and mm. um, Barbara Streisand. And I yeah. really like the sound of this movie, The Hot Rock, with yes. him and Redford. That, yeah. That's the one I really want to see. Yeah, I, I was wondering if you had seen that. because I, no, I, heard... I haven't seen a lot of Robert Redford either. I had heard about that film over the years and just recently, thanks to the Criterion channel, they uh, interviewed these young filmmakers that I really like called the Safdie brothers who did uncut gems uh, with um, Adam Sandler recently. And they're really, I think the future of people who do like film and movies talk about film and movies together. Uh, and they talked about the hot rock as a film they love. So uh, yeah, that's one I definitely want to see. I also want to see, the Owl and the Pussycat, uh, Carbon Copy, which I only recently heard of last year when we when we did our Denzel Washington talk, where Denzel Washington plays his son, his son that he only meets in That's his right. mid-20s. Uh, I haven't seen that. That sounds like a hilarious, great premise. Um, Where's Papa is another one um, heard about over the years. I have a book on 70s films uh, where they talk about it. Uh, Bye Bye Braver Man, just my love of Sidney Lumet, is a Sidney Lumet film from the late 70s, which is uh, apparently a little like Husbands, John Cassavetes' Husbands. This is another one I hadn't heard of long, too long ago called Loving, where he plays the husband of uh, Eva Marie Saint, who was in um, On the Waterfront. So that pairing, just alone, those two, I'd love to see that. Uh, no Way to Treat a Lady, which is him, Rod Steiger, and Lee Remick, looks like a great comedy. Again, just th those three names, you're like, I got to see that. And this is a Roger Corman one, the same Valentine's Day Massacre. Yeah, yeah, which, yeah, yeah, yeah. Jack Nicholson's yeah. in that too, and Bruce Dern. That's right. That's right. He is in that. And he, um, it's uh, Jason Robards. It's about, of course, Capone, right. Capone. and uh, the true story of the St. Valentine's Day Massacre from the late 60s. I believe that's pretty easy to find as well. Uh, I think this yeah, is, it's probably on YouTube or something. Yeah, I believe so. Uh, and this was an early performance of his called Ship of Fools. Oh, uh, I, I saw that. Yeah. I forgot about that. Yeah. That's an amazing yeah, yeah. movie. Yeah, That's I think movie. he has a small part in he, it. Yeah, I don't remember him in it. I remember Lee Marvin and Vivian Lee. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Uh, so th those are those are the ones I love. Uh, that oh, I want to see. One. See yeah, Ship I of Fools, see that. though. That's excellent. Yeah. I, I gotta see that. that one. But yeah, I, I, I gotta say, when I found uh, he passed, I it did kind of oh, it hit me because, like I said, he was he was an actor. He was a guy who got me excited about acting, and he's those kind of actors that I just love the everyman and the the humor and the drama. Uh, I just love those kind of actors. So this is our tribute to you, good sir, George Segal. And if anyone hasn't seen, yeah, as we salute, if anyone hasn't seen Born to Win. Or uh, fun with Dick and wow. Jane. Um, with, you can you can also uh, check those out, and they're they're pretty uh, accessible. Okay, well, this has been great. Thank you yeah. so much, everyone who uh, tuned in today. Uh, for anyone, uh, if this is your first time here, right beside in the, in the description box is the subscribe button. Please click on that. Uh, and then click the bell in order to get a notification every time we release a new video or go live. And for anyone watching the replay, uh, floating above my head to your top left right now, you will see the Movie versus Film logo, which you can also click in order to subscribe. Okay. Well, Steve, thanks so much. Another hey, great review. You. And uh, we will see everyone soon. Take care. Bye.